Hello. This lecture concerns uh, some notable features of game theory. Game theory, uh, as defined in your textbook, is an analysis of how to make rational choices when the payoffs depend on someone else's rational choices. You'll notice there's a lot of parallels between individual rational choice theory and game theory in that in a game theory, you're assuming that everybody is playing the sort of individual rational choice game. Everybody is trying to do what would maximize their expected utility or what would accomplish some specific goal that that individual has. Some key types of games that are discussed in the text uh, include zero sum games. Uh, that is, uh, games where a win for one means that there has to be a loss for another. Uh, so, for example, uh, pro sports leagues are zero sum. Uh, for every team that wins, somebody loses, right? There are only so many wins to go around. Um, and some things in life really are that way, where they're a zero sum game. Many things in life are not. They're what they call positive sum. Uh, so just to, as an illustration, imagine that you uh, have more chickens than you know what to do with, and your neighbor has more grain than they know what to do with. And so um, it seems like the natural thing to do then is to swap surpluses, right? Give them some chickens, and then they'll give you some grain. Uh, and this is trade. And so what happens is everybody actually ends up better off uh, than they were before. Uh, that is what is called a positive sum game. And so it's worth looking around in reality, in your real actual life, to see which kinds of interactions are zero sum and which kinds of interactions are positive sum. That is where uh, you, know, you can have win-win scenarios. Another game that uh, mirrors many situations in everyday life is the volunteer's dilemma. Um, this is uh, the uh, like the the belling of the cat story, right? Uh, where everybody wants a certain outcome, but doesn't want to be the one that expends their own resources or goes to their own risk to bring it about. And so it benefits everybody if somebody does it, but nobody wants to be the one who does it, right? Um, there are various kinds of coordination games. These are games in which everybody benefits, but only if they coordinate. For example, it doesn't really matter, ultimately, which side of the road we drive on, uh, as long as everybody drives on the same side of the road. Uh, it ultimately wouldn't matter if a red light meant go and a green light meant stop, uh, again, as long as everybody uses the same color to mean the same thing. Right? So everybody benefits, uh, but only so long as we coordinate. And of course, there are games of escalation. Uh, these are essentially uh, games of chicken, as it were, uh, where there are some benefits, right, to to being to engaging in some kind of a risk, at least up to a point. Uh, at a certain point, uh, the risks don't really benefit anybody. They don't pay any. Uh, there's no payoff at all. Uh, in fact, there's disaster. Uh, that's the way many escalation games go. Uh, and of course, there are prisoners' dilemmas, uh, perhaps the most interesting kind of uh, game theoretical construction, uh, where each individual's rational choice leads to the overall worst outcome. In fact, I want to take a little bit of time to uh, give you an example of a uh, situation where the prisoners' dilemma uh, has had a really, really interesting uh, impact on uh, some important ideas. This goes all the way back to this fellow here. Uh, this is Thomas Hobbes. Uh, you may have heard of him before. If not, that's Thomas Hobbes. Uh, he lived from 1588 to 1679, and uh, just for reference, uh, the Thirty Years' War, a, a very destructive period of a lot of uh, sort of uh, sectarian wars in Europe uh, occurred from roughly 1618 to 1648. And so if you'll kind of do the math there, that's sort of the bulk of uh, Hobbes' adult life. Uh, and so that certainly uh, couldn't have uh, helped but had some impact on his interest in uh, things, in issues like authority, uh, violence, uh, peace, and those sorts of things. Uh, his uh, most famous publication is uh, a book called Leviathan, uh, which it's called that because it's a really big book. I'm kidding, it isn't. It's actually a, a reference to a, a biblical creature. Um, he also had a cartoon tiger named after him. Um, and actually, that's a little bit relevant here. Uh, if you remember the Calvin and Hobbes uh, uh, cartoon strip, which is really excellent. If you haven't heard of that, I recommend looking it up. It's it's fantastic. Um, uh, 
the author, uh, Bill Waterston, had said that uh, Calvin and Hobbes were names he chose because uh, the Enlightenment thinkers John Calvin and Thomas Hobbes, this guy here, uh, had a reputation for having a sort of bleak view of human nature, right? Thinking of, of humans as uh, sort of inherently foul and terrible and bad and uh, vicious and all that sort of stuff. And um, I'm going to argue that that reputation is a bit unfair uh, as, certainly with Hobbes I'm not really say one thing I'm not going to say anything one way or the other about Calvin but uh, certainly with Hobbes I think that that reputation is a little bit unfair uh, I think you'll be able to see based on what he says here where the uh, reputation comes from but uh, perhaps why it's uh, you know uh, maybe a little unfounded so what Hobbes does that's really important is he invents something called a social contract theory, which is probably uh, the most important idea in all of Western uh, civilizations, political thinking, you know, the, the whole run of it. It's, it's a, uh, there are lots of important ideas. Uh, this is one of the very most important, possibly the most important uh, idea in political philosophy. And a social contract theory works this way. Uh, first off, what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to imagine life without government. Okay, this is what's called by philosophers imagining the state of nature. So the state of nature is this hypothetical condition under which people are living without any kind of government. Historically, people have always had some kind of an authority structure, whether it be family authority, clan, tribe, something, right? But just as a thought experiment, you want to say, all right, imagine there's just no government authority at all. I like to call this the it's a wonderful life method uh, of figuring out what might be valuable about government is that is by thinking of a, a situation in which it doesn't exist. Uh, of course, that's named after the film. It's a wonderful life, which if you haven't seen that, you must not ever have owned a television anywhere near Christmas time. Um, but uh, basically, the if you haven't seen it, the idea of the movie is that a guy named George Bailey, uh, you know, runs into, a, you know, a couple of bad events happen that uh, make him kind of think about taking his own life. And some angel comes down and shows him, actually shows him the world uh, if he had never existed. And it turns out he was more valuable than he thought. So that's that can be an interesting way of thinking about how valuable something is, is by thinking about what life would be like without it. And so what you want to do is you want to imagine life without government and think of what kind of problems you might run into if there just were none. Um, and then you then propose some kind of a solution, right, to all of the problems that, that, that occur in the state of nature uh, that it seems like any reasonable person would agree to. Uh, and then and then what you have is you have a, a rational basis uh, for having a government of a particular kind, for having rules of a particular kind, because you say, look, if, if we didn't have these kind of rules, life would be terrible. And um, in order to fix all of that terribleness, people, ought, uh, rational people would agree to adopt these kinds of rules, etc. That's essentially how an, a, a social contract theory works uh, in its sort of most simple form. So let's talk about the state of nature okay without government people are in their natural state that's where we get the phrase the state of nature and Hobbes says this about people in their natural state he says nature has made people so equal in their physical and mental capacities that although sometimes we may find one who is obviously stronger in body or quicker of mind than another Yet, taking all in all, the difference between one and another is not so great that one can claim to have any advantage of strength or skill or the like that can't just as well be claimed by some others. It's a very interesting observation. It's like, yeah, some people are stronger than others. Yeah, some people are smarter than others. But nobody is so much stronger than everybody else that they get whatever they want without having anything to fear from anybody. And nobody is so much smarter than everybody else that they get everything they want without having anything to fear from anybody. That's just not the way the world works. It's people are in generally evenly matched. And also consider people generally tend to want the same rough things out of life, right? They, uh, you know, if you, if you go through life thinking, what are other people like? Well, they're probably a lot like me. You're probably not going to be far off, not, not in the, in the broad uh, scheme of things. And so imagine that you live in the state of nature, in this, this hypothetical situation in which there's no government. Okay, there you are. You wander around, you go where you will, 
you know, there's, there's, there's just you, there's no rules, there's nothing. Like, the world, as they say, is your burrito, okay? Life is good. You have collected a pile of fruit because, of course, you, you got to eat, right? And so there's the fruit just sort of naturally occurring. So you, you pick some and, and, and you sort of gather it so that you don't have to go and pick it later when you're hungry. And uh, and yeah, I mean, that's, that's you're, you're doing just fine. And now what I want you to do is I, I want you to imagine what could maybe rain on your parade a little bit. What, what might cause a bit of a wrinkle in this whole uh, sort of idyllic, um, you know, Jeremiah Johnson kind of situation that you're living in here. Uh, and of course, if you've seen the film Jeremiah Johnson, you know the answer is it's somebody else. Um, and so, hey, there's somebody else. Uh, now, if you're you, you don't know anything about this person, this person is not known to you, but they're another person. And so, there's a certain number of of uh, uh, questions that you kind of have a pretty good idea already of the answer to. So, um, how smart are they? Well, probably more or less as smart as you. How strong are they? Well, probably about as strong as you are, give or take. Um, what do they want out of life? Uh, probably same thing you do. And in fact, if you look closer, you'll notice they've got their own little pile of fruit that looks suspiciously like yours. Uh, because again, they sort of want the same thing out of life that you want. And not only do you know this about them, but you have to know that if you know it about them, they know it about you, right? And if you know that they know it about you, then you know that they know that you know that they know, et cetera. And they know that you know that they know, et cetera. So what, what, what's going on here is not... is, is Knowledge is what you have in your mind. Shared knowledge is what you both have in your mind. Common knowledge is something that you know that they know that you know, and vice versa, right? So there's it's common knowledge that you're roughly evenly matched here, that you want the same things out of life, uh, and, and etc. Okay, and so well, this person is a potential threat, right? Uh, you know that that you you have to know that if you're thinking about eliminating them as a threat, they were probably thinking about eliminating you as a threat, and so this is a this is a fraught situation. Uh, now uh, let's add something to the thought experiment for a second. Let's assume that you're armed. You've got this nice shillelagh stick here, right? So uh, that must mean um, that uh, you know you know of course who would go around the state of nature without a shillelagh stick? So of course so so is the other person. If you've thought to arm yourself, so have they. Um, they're just about as smart as you. Keep in mind, um, they want the same things you want. They can think the same way you think. Uh, so. Now that everybody has a deadly weapon, everybody, of course, must be safer, right? Um, well, unfortunately, no. The, the fact that everybody has a deadly weapon in the conflict doesn't make the conflict go away. It just makes the stakes higher. Um, so you essentially have two choices here. You can decide to react peaceably, say, well, you know what? I'm not going to attack this person. I'm going to behave in a way that I don't believe they're going to attack me. Um, and so, yeah, I'm just going to go sort of back to living my life, right? Or you can say, I'm going to prepare for an assault here or look to get in a good lick before, before they come after me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to choose war, essentially. Um, and those are your options. And because you know that those are your options, you have to know that those are their options as well. And you have to know that they know that you know that they know, right? This is all common knowledge. So they know that you have two options. They know they have the same two options. That is peace or war. Go, just go about your lives. Or, uh, you know, uh, fight it out and be prepared to be prepared for violence. Well, it looks like we can make a table out of this. And, and as I've said before, every time you can make a table, you should. And um, so let's let's make a little table and see what happens here. So um, if if you both choose peace. OK, right. That is, uh, you both just decide to go about, you know, go go about your lives as 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 they were before, right? Then it's we we get this sort of live and let live outcome, and honestly, that's a pretty good outcome that lets everybody sort of continue on and just you know being themselves and doing whatever. But now, what happens if you choose peace, right, and your your opponent chooses war? What happens then, right? Think about that, right? You decide to go about your life, and they kind of take the opportunity to kill you and take your fruit. Uh, they win, <laughs> you lose, um, and um, that's that's a that's a very bad outcome for you. In fact, that's a disaster for you. It's a it's a it's a good outcome for them. They've eliminated a, a rival and acquired resources. Okay, that's a win. 
Um, so, of course, on the other side, you know, they know and you know, and they know that you know that you have the same option, that if they choose to just go about their lives as usual, you could decide to kill them, in which case it'll be an easy win for you if they're not prepared and uh, you take their fruit. And so what mean what 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 this means is that everybody is in a kind of uneasy standoff because uh, you know they say well I guess I'm going to be prepared for violence and what that means is that you take a shot when you have a shot and you're going to end up fighting it out and uh, we're going to call that one 50-50 at best okay because essentially even even if you win uh, you might in the course of this conflict uh, suffer uh, some form of life changing injury um, or even or even die yourself. Um, and so again, we're going to say 50-50 at best. By far, the worst outcome uh, is is up here. So if you look at, at all of these four possibilities uh, based on the two choices of two individuals, again, notice each of these individuals knows exactly what this table looks like. They could reason it out. If one of them can, so can the other. Um, obviously, the best outcome, what economists call the optimal outcome, optimal just means best, is this live and let live, right? That's That's the best for everybody concerned. And that's an important consideration, right? That that's the, the that's the best thing. But look at it just from one person's perspective. Say, let's look at it from your perspective, okay? So if you choose war, okay, the worst thing that happens is this is a tie, and the best thing that happens is a win. If you choose peace, the best thing that happens is a tie. And the worst thing that happens is is a catastrophe, a disaster, a, a a bad loss, right? The last loss you ever you ever take. And so, given that, what seems like the rational choice for you? Well, seems like war seems to be a better choice because at best it's a win, and at worst it's a loss. Instead of at best it's a tie, and at worst it's a loss, right? Um, uh, sorry, at best a win, worst a tie. Yeah. So so. Because you know that this is your calculation, you must know that this is their calculation as well, and vice versa. They know that you know that they know, right? And so the, if they choose war, it's at best a tie, uh, or sorry, at worst a tie, and at best a win. And if they choose peace, it is um, at best, uh, you know, uh, if, if they choose peace, then it's, it's at best a tie and at worst a, a catastrophic loss. Uh, so again, they have the same uh, uh, motivation that you have. They they just want to live. Um, they just want to sort of you know go on eating their fruit. Um, they don't want to die, and and they're rational, and so are you. And so notice that that you're going to choose war, and so are they. Um, that's the rational choice. If you just do like individual rational choice theory from both ends, uh, not only do you know that it's the rational choice for you, you know it's the rational choice for them, and they know it's the rational choice for you too, right? And, and so again, this is common knowledge. So everybody knows that the rational thing to do is going to lead to this, which is actually the worst outcome on the board, right? And at this point, uh, you should recognize that this is a prisoner's dilemma. But I want to pause here for a second. So are the people involved here going to choose war because they're bloodthirsty? No, not particularly. Uh, make them make them both as, 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 you know, sort of nice and affable people as, as you wish, right? They just don't want to die. Um, uh, make them, you know, really sort of cooperative and interesting and, you know, sort of peace-loving people, but they're just not willing to risk their lives, right, for, for, for that, right? They're not willing to, you know, put themselves into a bad position. Uh, is that um, evil? Is that a, you know, is that a pessimistic view of human nature? Uh, I, I can't see how it is. Uh, and I can't see how Hobbes is suggesting something other than that people will do what is rational to sort of survive and thrive. Uh, and so, yeah, no, this is a prisoner's dilemma, and prisoner's dilemmas will lock people, no matter what their natures are, uh, into the worst outcome available instead of the best outcome available. And again, uh, the, the literature in the, the textbook is, is pretty clear. Uh, this is called a prisoner's dilemma because of the example that's usually used to explain it, which is, uh, you know, two, two prisoners uh, and you, you know, you say, OK, well, look, if one of you turns on the other one and provides evidence, then, you know, you get to, you get a special deal and then they go to prison for a long time. And what happens is they both end up turning on each other and they both go, <laughs> go to prison for a long time. Um, and that's, you know, again, they, they get the worst ex they get the worst um, outcome overall. Uh, because they're doing the individually rational thing for each of them. And so the prisoner's dilemma is any situation in which the individually rational decision leads people into the overall worst outcome. And when you have more than two players, 
which happens many times in social and political life. Uh, it's called a, a sort of a, a tragedy of the commons or uh, something like that. That's a, a, a Pinker talks a lot about these, uh, and they're very important. But uh, back to Hobbes for a minute, because uh, this is the sort of uh, really famous passage uh, from Hobbes's work that explains all this. Uh, so Hobbes says, therefore, whatever results from a time of war, when everyone is enemy to everyone, also results from a time when people live with no other security but what their own strength and ingenuity provides them with. In such conditions, there is no place for hard work because there is no assurance that it will yield results and consequently no cultivation of the earth, no navigation or use of materials that can be imported by sea, no construction of large buildings, no machines for moving things that require much force, no knowledge of the face of the earth, no account of time, no practical skills, no literature or scholarship, no society, and worst of all, continual fear and danger of violent death. And the life of a, a person in the state of nature then is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. A very, 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 very famous line from Hobbes. Like nobody will ever believe you've read any anything to do with Hobbes if you don't know that solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short line. And so what Hobbes is describing here is what the state of nature is really like, what life without government is really like. He says the, there, there's no cooperation possible because anytime you come across another person, you're just locked in this uh, sort of Hobbesian trap, right? This this prisoner's dilemma uh, where you both know that the, that you both know that uh, the rational choice is to fight it out um, uh, that you know even even if they say hey trust me uh, you know, let us be blood brothers let us let us swear off this ridiculous prisoner's dilemma that we both know we're in like can you trust them right it's like even if they mean it uh, you can't really afford to take them at their word and more so, moreover, even if they mean it, they know that you can't afford to take them at their word. <laughs> and so that they're going to be looking for any opportunity to get you as well, no matter what you say. Uh, and, and you know that they know that and they know that you know that. And, you know, that's that's the trouble. And so you, you just get this really, really horrible, continual fear and danger of violent death. You don't get any kind of cooperative enterprise. You don't get any of the good things that come out of cooperation with other human beings. And so how do we get out of this mess? Because, of course, that's not the way that life in general is. Well, Hobbes's proposed solution is, in fact, the solution that we have taken to this kind of problem uh, over the long uh, history of our species. He says, what if a covenant, meaning an agreement, a contract, right? What if a covenant is made in which the parties do not perform now, but trust one another to perform at an appropriate time in the future? Uh, if this happens in the condition of mere nature, that is without government, which is war of everyone against everyone, then the contract is void if one of the parties has a reasonable suspicion that the other one is not going to perform. Uh, so imagine that they've both agreed not to attack each other. Well, that contract only matters if you don't have any reasonable suspicion that they might, like, you know... <laughs> go back on their word and attack you anyway, uh, which of course you know they might because you might. Uh, so for the one who performs first has no assurance that the other will perform later, right? If you turn your back first, you have no, you have no guarantee that they're going to turn their back instead of just, you know, striking at that point. Because the bonds of words are too weak to reign in men's ambition, greed, anger, and other passions, unless there is something to be feared from some coercive power. And in the condition of mere nature, where all are equal and all are judges of the reason reasonableness of their own fears, there can't possibly be such a power. So the one who performs first merely betrays themselves to their enemy, which is contrary to their right to defend their life and means of living. On the other hand, if there is a common power set over both parties to the contract, with right and force sufficient to compel performance, the contract is not made void by the suspicions of either party to it. When there is a power set up, right? When there is a power set up to constrain those who would otherwise violate their faith, that fear, namely the suspicion that the other party will not perform, is no longer reasonable. So the one who is covenanted to perform first is obligated to do so. 
Now, this is a really clever solution. In fact, that's the solution that we mostly use to get out of these kinds of Hobbesian traps and prisoners' dilemmas. We have an authority that has the power to levy fines and, 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 and to punish transgressors of the rules. You say you make some rules, and then you make somebody to enforce the rules, right, and enforce it f for everybody. And then, then our agreements actually matter, right? Somebody can hold us to our contracts. Hobbes called this power, this, you know, uh, uh, essentially a government, he called this sort of, this function of government, he called it the Leviathan. Um, so that's the common power to enforce the performance of contracts. Um, the, the quote is actually from Job chapter 41. It's a big monster, right? Uh, the main purpose of the Leviathan is to enforce a monopoly on violence, to say, okay, nobody gets to use violence except the Leviathan, right? And it seems like any reasonable person, in order to avoid the obvious problems with the state of nature, that is, to live a life that is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short, would agree to give up their right to use violence, and they would give it over to the Leviathan, right? They'll say, okay, fine. Like, I'm, I'm going I'm, I'm, I'm to renounce my right, right to use violence uh, in the service of my own goals, as long as everyone else does too, and gives that over to the Leviathan. Leviathan has a monopoly on violence. So I'm willing to give up my right to use violence as long as everybody else is too, right? And that's what gives a government, for example, the legitimate monopoly on violence. And so let's see like let's actually just watch and see how the leviathan the presence of a leviathan changes the rationality in, inherent in the state of nature inherent in this kind of prisoner's dilemma so um again we're back to this table here you can choose war you can choose peace we see all the layouts and remember the rational choice for both parties uh, individually in the state of nature was to choose war all right and that's the worst outcome available that's that's tragic so now imagine there's a Leviathan involved, okay? Uh, it has all the, the power to enforce this monopoly on violence, and, and we're going to simplify things a lot just for the sake of illustration. We're going to assume this Leviathan, this government, has one rule and one rule only, and that is no violence, okay? And they have one and only one punishment for violence, and that is death. Now, in reality, of course, you know, actual governments, actual authorities of various kinds are much more nuanced, have much more ranges of different punishments for different kinds of transgressions, etc. But again, for the sake of simplicity, there's one rule, no violence, and uh, one punishment, death. All right. So uh, if you're looking at, if everyone's, everyone's looking at their options, right, if um, your opponent chooses uh, peace, okay, and you choose war, Right. What would you? What used to be a win for you? Uh, well, now the Leviathan kills you. So I don't think you can regard that as a win anymore. But if uh, you choose peace and your opponent chooses war, well, then Leviathan kills them. And so what would have been regarded as a win for them is no longer a win. Now it's a loss. All right. But if you decide, if you both choose war, then right, which is what you would have done in the state of nature, uh, and just sort of fight it out. Well, the Leviathan kills you both, right? No violence means no violence, right? So now look at the options, okay? Um, if you choose war, no matter what happens, you die, all right? So not only do you know that, but you know that your opponent knows that, and your opponent knows it and knows that you know it, right? So that's common knowledge now that if you if if you choose war, you just both die, right? So now do you have any hesitation in choosing peace? No, of course not. That's the obvious rational call. And so the presence of Leviathan has changed the game. Uh, by changing the way it's, uh, the, the rules of the game, it changes the way that the players play the game. And uh, everybody chooses peace. And then we get the best outcome on the board instead of the worst outcome on the board. And so that's how an authority tends to solve a prisoner's dilemma for all parties concerned. So here are some interesting things about the social contract theory. And these kinds of realizations are a little bit counterintuitive. They run against what you would normally think, which really, again, makes them the best kind of realizations in my view. And so the first thing about the social contract theory is really interesting is that it indicates that paradoxically, again, you know, contrary to what you might think, sometimes more rules actually mean more freedom. Right? We normally think of rules and governments and all that sort of stuff as just stuff that gets in our way, you know, it decreases our freedoms, it's bad, we should have as little of that as possible, etc. Right? That's, that's, that's a very common thought. Um, and technically, there are no rules in the state of nature. Technically, it's a state of perfect freedom. But practically, you're not very free at all. 
right? If you decide in the state of nature that you just want to be a painter and paint pictures of landscapes, well, you can do that until somebody just kills you and takes your stuff uh, because you're not devoting your life to sort of protecting protecting your, your life against every possible interloper uh, and, uh, you know, sort of preemptively striking against anybody that might eventually threaten your, your life or livelihood. Uh, if you decide to plant a bunch of crops, well, somebody will just take the crops. And if you try and stop them, they'll kill you. Um, <laughs> that's the state of nature for you. So in, in reality, there's not much freedom there. Uh, practically speaking, there's 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 almost none. You, you got a very, very small, limited set of options. But all of a sudden, if everybody sort of gives over their right to use violence, gives it over to a Leviathan, has a legitimate uh, authority here uh, that has a, a monopoly on force, well, now all of a sudden there's all kinds of the fruits of civilization, right? Cooperation, rational argument, uh, you know, contracts, agreements, uh, you know, cooperative ventures, you know, devoting your life to something larger than yourself. Uh, all of a sudden, all of that becomes possible in a practical way. And so uh, that's one of the cool things about the social contract theory is that uh, paradoxically, sometimes when we give up some of our rights, some of our freedoms, we actually get, practically speaking, more freedoms. We get more real options out of it. Uh, and, and, and so does everybody. But it also makes some testable predictions, right? Uh, one of these is that as governments, um, uh, that is Leviathans, get much larger and more powerful over time, uh, you would think then that the rates of violence should also substantially decrease. Um, and if you listen to your availability bias, you'll think, well, that hasn't happened. Our crime rates and violence rates are as high as they've ever been, et cetera, right? Um, but if you look at the actual data, it's very clear that that uh, you're living in the most peaceable time in human history, and it's not even close. Rates of violence have plummeted um, as governments have gotten larger and more well-organized. Uh, that's both interpersonal violence uh, and intergroup violence, that is sort of warfare, things like that. Um, it's all gotten much, much, much better uh, as governments have gotten larger and more well-organized. In fact, uh, Steven Pinker, the author of Rationality, uh, wrote a whole book called The Better Angels of Our Nature uh, about this exact trend in, a, in, in the decrease of violence over time. I'd recommend it to anybody. But also, places and times with the least effective leviathans should also be the most violent. And that broadly gets borne out. Uh, places uh, where there have been recent revolutions, uh, the government is is new, it's it's uh, you know just trying to get things under control. It, these are very uncertain and violent societies, um, and uh, it sucks to live there, uh, especially for the ordinary people who are just trying to live their lives. Um, uh, whereas, you know, long established, uh, you know, stable governments with, with, you know, sort of, you know, powerful law enforcement arms, um, you know, uh, like most of Western Europe, you know, the United States for the most part, um, you know, places like they, they, they tend to be fairly safe and secure and, and people can, you know, just go about their lives as they, as for the most part, as they please. So, um, you know, imagine a kind of exception, imagine that you're going to be doing something illegal right? So you're going to get involved in, say, a drug deal or something like that. Um, now imagine somebody steals your drugs or double crosses you in the deal. Well, you can't call the police, right? And so about the only thing you can do is try and sort of retaliate in some way that makes your reputation credible. And, and, and notice that if you're in a criminal enterprise, now all of a sudden you're kind of in a little miniature state of nature. And so it should be no surprise that criminal activity is one of those things that if you're associated with it, uh, your, your risk of, of something bad happening to you as a result of violence, uh, it, you know, goes way, way, way up. It skyrockets. Um, and, and part of the reason for that is just what Hobbes was saying, that you, when you're when you're outside of the Leviathan, yeah, life is solitary, nasty, poor, brutish, and short. Um, and so uh, authority uh, really does solve various uh, kinds of uh, prisoners' dilemmas uh, in a very interesting uh, kind of a way.